Uh, good morning. I'm Marco Hansen. I'm a Spanish translator and interpreter in Austin, Texas. And I was teaching my first online class last night by Zoom for the University of Texas uh, uh, Center for Professional Education's um, Legal Interpreter Certificate Program and ran out of time. Uh, teaching online is a different experience, and so I didn't face things quite yet. And the segment that I didn't get to was ideas for how to use the coronavirus quarantine downtime to build up your business. And as a freelancer, whether you're a translator or an interpreter, or if you work in um, some other part of the business, like teaching people how to speak a second language, um, you might suddenly find yourself with a lot of free time, especially if you normally go and work on site. And, oh, they're sticking up. Too late for that, right? <laughs> Doing everything backwards is hard. Um, so I came up with 10 ideas that would help you to make the best use of this time until we can get out and interact again like normal people. And the first one is think of a name for your business. Um, instead of just marketing yourself as an individual, if you think long term uh, to the day when you may be subcontracting jobs to colleagues or hiring teams to work on bigger projects together, come up with a name that encapsulates that. And it could be based on your last name, like my name is, my last name is Hansen, so it could be Hansen Interpretation or Hansen Translation or Hansen Language Services, or it could be um, something, something bigger, more universal. And it takes a while to come up with a good name for a business. You have to do some research and figure out what names are available. And you have to think about the scope, how big of an area do you want to cover? Do you want to just be your language that, your second language that you know, or other languages that you work in? Or do you want it to be more universal so that it gives you room for growth? But name your business. And if you um, want to register, if you haven't done this, you can register a DBA or an assumed name certificate with your local government. It might have a different name where you live. But that gives you the legal right to present yourself as that business name rather than as an individual. And um, where I live, those just cost $15 to file a certificate. And then it lets you open a business account and do some things that you can't as an individual. And it's a super simple way to set up a business. It doesn't require a, a lawyer or um, filing any forms other than a one page document. Uh, number two, I recommend getting a professional email as a um, translation business uh, owner. I get a lot of emails from freelancers that are um, old-fashioned addresses like uh, AOL.com or Hotmail.com, or they um, are mysterious combinations of numbers and letters that set off uh, red flags in my head, and I think this is a spammer. Um, no legitimate business person is going to send an email from an address like that, and so I delete it or ignore it when it might actually be a real freelancer who's looking for work. So a professional email address, it can still be free, it can still be Gmail, uh, but it should just be your name or the name of your business that you've come up with in step one. Uh, there shouldn't be any numbers in a professional email address. For me, when I see numbers, it tells me that um, whoever went to register their address who's already taken and so gmail or the provider popped up and said oh how about you just tag this random number 32 to the end of your name and the person just clicked on yes okay i'll do that even though 32 means nothing to me and so i i recommend no numbers um no old urls like aol or hotmail or yahoo and um, no uh, abbreviations. Some people will have a long last name and so they'll abbreviate it and just drop out all the vowels and then there's a strange string of consonants at the end of their email. It should be an easy name, an easy word to say on the phone to somebody and have them write down. And if your name is longer or more complicated, then think about uh, going with a shorter version of it. Just um, uh, make it Make it simple for the people who you're giving your email address to so they don't get confused and have to have you spell it over and over. Uh, but a separate email for business purposes is important. Um, you can keep the one that you've always had for your personal email for your family. That's fine. And then just uh, keep those apart. Uh, tip number three, I would really recommend that you join LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn is a 
as most of you know, is a, a free uh, social marketing, social media um, website for businesses to communicate. And I, I don't get work per se from LinkedIn, but I maintain a presence there. I have an account, I have my picture up, I have my contact information, a, a little bit about uh, my career, uh, where I went to school. And that way, when I contact somebody new for the first time, and they want to know, am I real or am I a spammer? Because there's so much spam going on in every industry, including translation and interpretation. They can Google my name and my LinkedIn profile will show up and it will just give them a lot more of confidence that I'm a real person. And so joining LinkedIn is free and it's not that complicated. If you don't know how to do it, uh, you can Google join LinkedIn and get step-by-step -step guides. Uh, along the same vein, uh, my tip number four is join an association. If you're an interpreter, look at the interpreter associations. If you're a translator, the translator associations. If you do both, a lot of the associations cover both. And the smaller regional associations, um, some of them cost $30 or $40 a year to join. The bigger national or international ones might cost a few hundred dollars. But start with one of the local ones and you'll find that, hey, good morning guys. Um, you'll find that uh, you quickly meet people through those association contacts, whether you attend the meetings or just interact with them online. You get information through their newsletters that's useful and it points you in new directions that you hadn't thought of before. And you can also, if you choose to, um, publish your contact information on their directories. And you'll always get some spam from that, but you'll also get actual job offers and uh, opportunities to apply for work. And so I think the uh, professional associations uh, quickly set you apart as being somebody who's more than dabbling in the business. Even if you're a beginner, you don't look like a beginner once you join a professional association. And it's quick and easy to do. They don't ask you um, for your credentials. Well, for certain levels of membership, they might. But just to join, you don't have to prove that you've been doing this for any amount of time. You don't have to show them your degree. You just have to express an interest in what that association does. So here in Texas, um, we have TAJIT, the Texas Association of Judiciary Interpreters and Translators, uh, TAHIT, the Texas Association of Healthcare Interpreters and Translators. We have in my area, ATIA, A-A-T-I-A, the Austin Area Translators and Interpreters Association. And in each of the major metro areas, there's a separate regional association, APITA in El Paso and AMITA in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and HITA in the Houston area. And so find out what associations are available and then uh, look through the uh, membership details and figure out which one you can afford to join first. And it doesn't hurt to join several, uh, little by little. Uh, number five, um, I would uh, recommend that once you have your business name and your professional email and your LinkedIn profile and you've joined an association, uh, that you set up your email signature. And if you notice, anytime a business person sends you an email, there will be a signature at the bottom that says, you know, sincerely, comma, and then their name and their position title and the name of their company and their email address and phone number, and then maybe um, a link to their LinkedIn profile or to their website or um, some other uh, indicator of credibility. And this is a, a big uh, way that spammers are uh, distinguished from legitimate business people because spammers will have a strange uh, signature line or none at all. Um, we use a signature line to tell if some new person we've met online is for real. And so if you go down to the bottom and you can find, uh, uh, it's called credibility indicators, um, like a LinkedIn profile and click on that and you take it to a profile of an actual person who looks real and has other contacts and friends on LinkedIn um, that verify their legitimacy, uh, then uh, people will trust doing business with you. And so look at other translators and interpreters you know that you've emailed before, uh, see what they put in their signature line and uh, try to come up with uh, a signature line. If you're, if you're new to the business, you might not have a lot of impressive credentials to put in there and you might feel a little bit intimidated by it, but everybody um, can put something down there. Uh, let's say you're a Spanish interpreter who does a little bit of translation. Um, you can put Spanish translator and interpreter. If you have a degree uh, that's related to any of those fields, maybe you have a uh, bachelor's degree in architecture, um, you can put a comma, uh, 
bachelor's degree at the end. If you have a bachelor's degree in Spanish, then you can put bachelor's degree in Spanish. Whatever you have um, that will establish you as a professional, you can include a summary of it in your signature line. The signature line is kind of like a tiny resume. You don't want to put too much information on there, just a couple of lines, but it's good to include some kind of a link that people can click on, like your uh, membership profile in a professional association or your LinkedIn profile so that they can verify if it's the first time they've had contact with you that you're a real person and not trying to spam them like um, so much of the email that we get. Uh, tip number six, uh, next you can create a resume or update your resume. It's likely that you have an old resume from a while back, but maybe you haven't done anything with it for a while. And if you are going to be applying for work in translation or in interpretation or in language instruction or some kind of a language consultancy, you should have a current resume that is tailored to that, uh, that specialty that focuses on your skills and your experience in that area. And um, hey, lots of people. Hi, Holly. Uh, hi, Sandra. Hey, Dora. Holly, thank you for giving me the idea to uh, do another one of these live broadcasts. Um, I, uh, uh, let's see, resumes. Um, a resume to work as a freelance translator or interpreter, I recommend you keep it one page. Nobody wants to read more than one page of a resume unless you're applying for an, some kind of an academic position. So you start with your contact information at the top and uh, the title of what you're trying to do, say, um, Spanish medical interpreter or a French legal translator, whatever it is that this resume is going to be applying for and then you um, list your relevant experience and credentials. And especially early on in your career, you may not have much to put in there. That's fine. The resume doesn't even have to be a whole page. A half page resume is good um, if it has uh, some information that is relevant and focused and that is written correctly. Uh, think of your resume as a mini um, audition. You're auditioning for a job as a language professional and as a language professional, the one thing that we can offer our market, our customers, is language expertise. So if you're writing your resume in English and sending it to English speakers, make sure that it's perfect English. And if English isn't your native language, find somebody whose native language is English, who has a degree from an English-speaking country, and beg your friend to review your resume and to uh, hack it apart and to bleed red ink all over it and make it better and correct any typos, any odd formatting. Like, for example, if your keyboard is set to French, it'll always want to put a space before exclamation points and question marks. And so you have to make sure that space is taken out because in English, you don't put spaces like that. Or if you're originally typing in a language that does um, quotation marks, like these two carrots at the ends, make sure that it's regular curly quotation marks. Um, that are used in American English, in my case. And so uh, prepare a resume, focus it on, on that uh, market, save it uh, under a file name that makes sense. Like for me, I'll put a uh, resume Hansen uh, Spanish interpreter 2020, and that's my file name. I get some resumes that have these mysterious cryptic file names, and then when I try to save it, I can never find it again because it didn't include the word interpreter didn't include the last name of the person that I'm searching for, and so um, it's uh, hard for me as, a, as somebody who's hiring translators to keep track of their resumes unless the file name is real clear. And then also save your resume as a PDF instead of a Word file. Um, when you send out Word files that are editable, um, it's just uh, easy for the formatting to change and it looks different on your customer screen than it did on your screen. If you save it as a PDF and you can do that out of Word, you just export as PDF. Um, then it locks everything in place and the formatting stays consistent. So um, after you've uh, crafted a current uh, resume and you've had somebody else help you proofread to get it in perfect English or perfect Spanish or whatever language you're sending it to, um, then you're ready to order business cards. Um, this is the one of the items on my list that isn't uh, free, but it's cheap. Uh, you can get decent business cards for $20. Uh, you can just find a place online to get those printed. Um, Vistaprint.com is a company that does the most online marketing. They'll pop up if you Google business cards. I've used them or um, overnightprinting.com, and they're both good. Uh, just 
a business card should be uh, simple and professional. There's lots of templates uh, that are already available and you just fill in the blanks. And um, thank you, Dora. Um, there are templates where you just fill in the blanks and now that you have joined an association, you can mention the association on there. Most of them will let you put their logo on your business card and suddenly that looks a lot more professional. Um, if you're an interpreter, it's a good idea to include a photo of yourself if you have a nice photo because when you appear in person to interpret, they're going to uh, remember your face. And then later on, when they want an interpreter, if they can flip through their business cards or look up on their bulletin board and find the face of that person that did such a good job before, it's easier for them to find you again. If you're a translator, then the photo doesn't make much of a difference because you'll be communicating through email. Uh, but the contact information um, and the a summary of any credentials that you have on your business card are enough. It doesn't have to be crowded. If you want to put some kind of a logo on there, there's lots of free uh, logos that are available in the templates uh, for creating a business card, or you can download your, your own, or you can get somebody to design you a custom logo on a website like uh, Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R.com. That's a marketplace for low-cost uh, logo design. Uh, Tip number eight, uh, we're doing eight out of 10 here, is to look at the low-end marketplaces. Now, again, if you've been translating and interpreting for a while, um, you can skip this step, but if you're new to the game, there are all kinds of uh, low-cost marketplaces where people send jobs the lowest bidder uh, for translation, especially less so for interpreting. Um, and it's a good place to uh, dip your foot in the water and find out uh, what uh, rates start at and to do some actual jobs to put on your resume and to get some feedback from customers and to just start building up a little bit of momentum and start making connections. You don't want to stay there long because they pay so little. Um, but one of the big ones, uh, international website uh, for translators is Pros or Prozy. Nobody knows how to pronounce it. Uh, proz.com and you make a profile on there kind of like you would on LinkedIn and you say I'm looking for um, this language combination for this kind of jobs maybe translation or subtitling or uh, transcription whatever skills you have and then anytime a customer comes on and posts a need um, they get uh, you get a notification and you can go on and look at whatever they posted and bid on and say, okay, I'm willing to do that for X number of cents a word or um, this rate per, per hour or per minute. And then they get those responses and they decide who they want to contact and you might get the offer if you're the low bidder or if you're the most qualified bidder within their budget. And then you communicate directly with them and they, uh, send you the job and they can pay you i think through pros or they can pay you directly uh, it, it keeps evolving i'm not sure where that's at right now um, but that is a is a great place uh, for beginners to start building up their experience um, other than uh, volunteer work there's always uh, volunteer social service groups in your community or schools or churches that need uh, translation and interpretation um, but i'm talking about places that we actually make a little bit of money Another one uh, that I mentioned before is Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R. -R. I haven't used this for translation, but I see that there are translators who post on there um, for very low rates um, offering their services. So you might get some uh, initial work through there. There's a website called Thumbtack, uh, thumbtack.com, where local um, freelancers in all kinds of businesses, including like electricians and painters and landscapers, um, make a little profile and post a description of what skills they have. And then if somebody in their area needs, say, a Spanish interpreter, except they'll call it Spanish translator because that's what people think interpreters are, um, they will go and look for them on Thumbtack and you'll get a notification saying somebody's looking, somebody has, has a medical appointment uh, next Tuesday and is looking for a Spanish translator. Are you available? And then you bid on that and they get back with you and you negotiate it and uh, get the job or not. And then you get ratings, kind of like Uber drivers. You'll get ratings for how many jobs you've done successfully and how many stars that you got. And that gives the potential future customers greater confidence that you're legit and you know what you're doing. So marketplaces like that are generally free to join. Um, sometimes they'll keep a percentage of each job. Sometimes they'll charge the 
uh, person who's posting the job a little bit or they'll charge you a little bit if you get hired for the job. But it's a, it's a low investment and low income, but it definitely builds up your experience if you're just getting started. And then there's old ones like uh, Craigslist where um, freelancers and all kinds of business uh, have uh, posted jobs and um, or gotten gotten hired for different jobs. Um, so just uh, if you're if you're kind of exploring and you wonder where is it that my market is hiding, uh, where are the jobs, uh, where are the people, um, where are my competitors or my colleagues uh, finding work? I get online and pretend like you're trying to find somebody like yourself. So I'm a Spanish translator and interpreter. And so I get online and I just imagine, what if I were looking for a Spanish translator or interpreter, what would I Google? And so I type Spanish interpreter, Spanish translator, and I see what comes up. There's always a bunch of ads at the top and then there's organic searches underneath uh, where people, actual people have um, posted information or blogs or websites offering their services. And by finding uh, what the market's like, um, uh, the market research, uh, this downtime is a great time to get online and do mystery shopping. You know, mystery shopping is where you pretend to be one of your own customers and figure out what it is that they're searching for and how they're searching and how you as a provider can put yourself in a place that those potential customers can find you. So that's, uh, let's see, I've got my little cheat sheet here. Um, that's number eight. Uh, number nine um, is to check out job postings. Uh, let's say you are open to a full-time job or a part-time job or freelance work. Uh, you've got lots of time. Maybe you're semi-employed now or you've finished another career and you're ready to move into another one. Um, look at job postings for full-time and part-time jobs in um, a variety of uh, uh, sources. For example, indeed.com is a big source of uh, job postings. Uh, Monster.com is an older one, and companies that need somebody full-time, part-time contract will post on there. And the easiest way to find those is to look up uh, your language. So I'll go on there and I'll put Spanish and search for all the jobs where Spanish is a hit. Or put uh, bilingual Spanish and search for all the jobs. And a lot of them will be customer service jobs. Maybe you're open to doing that, uh, working in a call center, I'm taking calls in both languages. Some of them will be administrative jobs, uh, like as a receptionist, where they want somebody who can deal with uh, the public in two languages. Some of them will be higher level, like uh, sales representatives, um, selling to people in the second language. And then occasionally you'll find hidden in their um, translation and interpretation jobs, whether they know to call it that or not. Um, some of them will be localization jobs. Uh, I have a friend who works for uh, I, iTunes, but indirectly through LineBridge. Um, when iTunes has content that it wants to publish to the Spanish-speaking market, um, they send it to him and he prepares it, um, translates it into Spanish and localizes it for a certain kind of Spanish for a certain country, and then publishes it so that iTunes can reach the customers in that country. And so the more you dig into the job postings that are currently going out, the more you understand where people with your skills are being hired and you figure out how to tweak your resume for that kind of job. And then when you send it out, it will, uh, the HR director's eyes will light up and he or she will be like, oh yeah, this is the kind of person that I'm looking for because your resume reflects the um, skills that they're looking for. Now, I'm not suggesting that you put stuff on your resume that's not true or that you um, uh, make up anything that you can't back up, that you can't actually deliver. Uh, but if you read through job descriptions for a certain specialized uh, language related job and you realize, yeah, you know, several years ago when I was working as a bilingual teacher, I actually got called on to do that a couple times. I can add that to my resume. I have a little bit of experience in that. And you don't have to have extensive experience in one area, but if you can figure out a little bit of experience you have doing several different things and add that to the resume, it makes it a lot stronger than if you just say, you know, I was, I was a bilingual teacher for five years, whatever that entails, because people in the business world don't know what it is that bilingual teachers do. You have to, you have to spell it out. You have to list out um, a description of each of the skills that involves. And I say bilingual teacher because that, that was my background. Um, 
translators and interpreters come from all over. Uh, we've done all different kinds of things, but we invariably come from some other field <laughs> into translation and interpretation and have to figure out how to, how to explain what we used to do to a new market. So um, look at, looking through the job postings in your language will give you some ideas on how to uh, reach new markets. And then uh, tip number 10, you need a cover letter. By email, you need a, a little sales pitch, a one paragraph um, contact to, to send out to maybe uh, to an HR director who's hiring somebody for a part-time position, maybe to send out to a company that's trying to find somebody for a limited basis to translate some materials, maybe to um, an individual who is looking for somebody to translate their transcript or a, a small set of documents. But each uh, time you contact a potential customer, you're sending out a cover letter, which is your email. And I cannot stress enough that your cover letter is your, um, represents your language skills. So if you're applying for, hey, Steve, um, if you're applying for work as a language professional, like in my case, who's fluent in Spanish and English, not just fluent, but as an expert in Spanish and English, and I send out a Spanish uh, email to somebody who I want to hire me, and it doesn't have accent marks, or it, uh, it doesn't have complete sentences, or uh, it has typos in it, or it looks like I had the English autocorrect on, and so I was changing the Spanish words into trying to come up with the close English equivalent. The Spanish speaker who gets that email is going to see that I'm not serious about the quality of my Spanish, and they're not going to give me the time of day. So if whichever language you're dominant in, um, I translate from Spanish into English, um, but if I'm contacting somebody in Spanish, I have to make sure that it's excellent Spanish because I want to respect the language of the person that I'm writing to. So whether you're a native English speaker or a native Spanish speaker, get somebody else to check your emails before you send them off, especially early on in your career um, when you're really working hard to establish some uh, long-term customers that'll keep on coming back to you. Have them check your email and look for any typos and just look for ways to make it sound a little bit more professional and uh, reliable and normal and um, it will pay off big time because it's, if you're writing to an agency, there are translation and interpretation agencies that hear from hundreds of freelancers every day. And the easiest way to get buried is just to have mistakes on there. And whoever is doing the hiring doesn't want to hire somebody who is so sloppy that they're going to make mistakes on their initial email contact. So if you craft a professional email with no mistakes. It has a nice signature line at the bottom, and the signature line demonstrates your credibility because you're a member of this professional association. Maybe you have this credential or this degree, and you have a resume attached, which is well written and has no typos and is simple and concise and focuses on the job or the gig that you're applying for. And you figure out who to send it to, and then you send it to them. Your chance of getting a response go way, way up all of a sudden you'll be at the top of the pack. You won't get a response every time. You might not get a response even half of the time, but your response rate will go up a lot higher. And at that point, it's a numbers game. You, um, let me see here. Um, you have to cast your net wide. You have to think big picture, think your local area, think your state, your region, your country, and then international. There are a lot of people from other countries that want to hire you depending on your language pair and the kind of business that they do. But the wider you can cast the net, the more little um, nibbles you'll get. I, I think I'm mixing my metaphors right here. <laughs> the more fish that you'll catch, little fish. And every time you catch a little fish, every time you get hired for a little gig, that's your chance to shine, to show them that you are cheerful, reliable, responsive, prompt. You don't bust your deadlines and you turn in quality work. You invoice on time at the agreed rate, you're reasonable, and you give that customer a good experience. And then the next time they need somebody in your language combination, you're going to be the go-to because, because we're all lazy. And no, none of us want to go out and try to develop a new relationship with a new provider if we're happy with the provider who provided for us last time. And so every time you have a happy customer, then you not only have an ongoing relationship with that customer, but you have referral opportunities where they're going to send their friends and colleagues and um, other 
uh, coworkers to you next time they need your language pairing combination. And little by little, you start building up this momentum. And as your career goes on, each year you spend less and less time on business development, less and less time marketing and sales, and more time just serving the needs of your repeat business. And so um, those are my 10 points right there uh, for how you can uh, use this downtime to build your business. Um, I, I wonder if anybody has any comments before I sign off. And if you don't now, you're always welcome to come and watch this later and type comments down there. And I'll jump in and answer them next time I'm on Facebook. So, anybody? No? Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. And good luck with your uh, quarantine and with your personal uh, professional marketing efforts. Have a great day.